Uh, hey everyone, hopefully you guys are uh, staying safe and uh, in the comforts of wherever you may be. Uh, this week we're going to pretty much uh, wrap up the U.S. history uh, curriculum. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a relatively longer video uh, that's going to cover uh, the national politics and the landscape of this country from uh, the late 60s uh, until 2008. And that is where um, the uh, U.S. history curriculum uh, will conclude. So uh, let's get started in here. Uh, so we've mentioned, I mean, we dove into the 1960s uh, in the previous lesson, uh, but we didn't really go too much into more uh, different types of civil rights, labor movements uh, outside of um, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, so for this one, uh, there were other uh, movements inside of the uh, Hispanic uh, community. Uh, you had uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, who helped uh, organize a strike against table grape growers in 1965. Uh, he wanted to have workers, many of whom were Mexican-Americans, to earn better wages and benefits uh, because they often faced uh, discrimination inside of the uh, work uh, workforce. And in 1966, uh, Cesar Chavez was able to fo uh, form the United Farm Workers under the American Federation uh, of Labor. Also in the 1960s, people began to be more aware of uh, stuff that's going on in our environment. Uh, and so there was a huge environmentalist uh, movement uh, that occurred uh, in this decade. In 1962, uh, Rachel Carson, who was a biologist, wrote a book called The Silent Springs. Uh, which decried the use of pesticides and their effects on the environment, focusing in on the use of uh, DDT uh, and events such as Cleveland's uh, Cuyahoga River catching fire helped spur the environmental movement of 1969. Uh, and so the thing was that many people began to take notice that a lot of factories uh, were dumping uh, oil uh, and grease and different types of waste into uh, into different bodies of water. And of course, it doesn't take much for, uh, for that to uh, cause a fire. And so many Americans thought that, hmm, well, maybe we should do a better job of trying to protect uh, the environment. And so in 1970, in response to Silent Springs and several environmental accidents, uh, Earth Day was formed by several groups to educate and promote uh, the environmental movement. Uh, I think April uh, Earth Day is it, I think it's every April 20th or 14th. I can't uh, remember off the top of my head. Let me just uh, take a quick look at this Earth Day 2020. Oh, April, April 22nd was Earth Day uh, this year. Okay, so uh, now into the 1970s, uh, after the tumultuous uh, assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy, who was JFK's younger brother, uh, the Democratic Party uh, was in disarray and its influence uh, crumbled. And also he had the, uh, a very unpopular Vietnam War that took a uh, staggered hold uh, on the nation. And so in 1968, uh, Richard Nixon uh, would become the president of the United States. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's approval ratings uh, were absolutely uh, plummeting due to the uh, Vietnam War. Large anti-protests occurred all over the country, and Nixon and Republicans seized their opportunity to take back the White House. And so this was the present, the Electoral College map at the time in 1968. Uh, as you can see, all the states that were colored that are colored in red were won by Richard Nixon. The states covered in blue were won by Hubert Humphrey, and the ones in yellow uh, were uh, uh, won by uh, uh, Governor. Uh, George Wallace uh, of Alabama. Uh, so Nixon's policies, uh, Nixon was thoroughly anti-communist, uh, but he believed that the only way to create a peaceful world was to build a better relationship with China and Russia, uh, who had very much communistic governments. Uh, he left a trade and travel restrictions with China and he became the first president to visit that country in 1972. And he hoped that this visit uh, would help force Russia to open peaceful talks with the United States. 
However, uh, there was plenty of scandal that dogged uh, Nixon's uh, presidency and his administration. Uh, and this is this is pretty much what Watergate is all about. In 1972 was, of course, the next presidential election that Nixon, of course, you know, he was trying to get reelected. Uh, he feared that various political issues might cause him to lose. And so some of Nixon's campaign staff began spying on his uh, opponents. And so in June of 1972, five men were linked to uh, Nixon's campaign, were arrested for breaking into the Democratic Party's headquarters in the Watergate Hotel. And so the men were attempting to steal campaign information and tap the phones. Uh, Nixon began to cover up any connection between his staff and the break-in, ordering the CIA to stop the FBI's investigation. And the president denied any wrongdoing and eventually won re-election by a very large margin. However, by 1973, it was revealed that Nixon had installed a taping system in the Oval Office to record conversations that he had hoped to use to write a book after he left office. And many people thought that inside of those uh, tapes would be very um, crucial information regarding Watergate. And of course, Nixon uh, refused to give up the tapes, which was uh, very suspicious uh, in the minds of the American people. So uh, Nixon refused to turn the tapes over to prosecutors that were investigating the break-in, but was eventually ordered to turn them over by the Supreme Court in 1974. Uh, with clear evidence of a presidential cover-up on the tapes, the House began discussions to impeach Nixon. And in August of 1974, uh, Nixon resigned from the presidency, leaving Gerald Ford his vice president in command. And so Nixon became the first and only U.S. president thus far in our nation's history to have resigned uh, while in office. Uh, he was never impeached. Uh, so that is something to uh, make sure that you know uh, that in our nation's history, only three presidents have ever been uh, impeached and none of them have been uh, convicted or found guilty. You had Andrew Johnson back in the 1860s. Uh, then you had, uh, well, later on, Bill Clinton in the 90s, and then Donald Trump uh, earlier in 2020. But Nixon was never uh, impeached. He quit before uh, anything could happen. All right, so now we're gonna get into the 1970s and 80s. So uh, in order, uh, you have Gerald Ford, which I'm circling right over here from my mouse. Uh, he was, of course, uh, Richard Nixon's vice president. Then you have George's own Jimmy Carter, uh, who will later defeat Gerald Ford in 1976. And then after Jimmy Carter, uh, you, have president, uh, you have Ronald Reagan, who's the governor of California, and he's going to serve two terms in the 1980s. And this picture down here is the Berlin Wall, a very symbolic uh, piece or a monument uh, that pretty much separated uh, East and West Berlin uh, and basically divided Germany as a whole. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some famous court cases that occurs in the 70s as far as uh, cultural phenomenons. Let me minimize my screen here if I can, but I can. I can okay. Anyways, uh, so some famous uh, court cases at this time, you have uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, this 1973 ruling held that women have the constitutional right under cer certain circumstances to terminate a pregnancy under the 14th Amendment and the idea of privacy afforded under the Constitution. And of course, this, is, uh, this remains a, a hot button issue. And I'm sure you guys have heard in the news a lot recently about the topic of abortion, and this is what the uh, this court case uh, deals with. Uh, you also have the University of California versus uh, Back in uh, this 1978 ruling allowed schools to consider race while evaluating applications for admission to college for the purpose of diversity, and this ruling was seen as a support for affirmative action. So uh, the 1970s in general was a period of soul searching in this country. Uh, it was a very strange and tumultuous time. Uh, the United States essentially uh, was losing and lost the Vietnam War. The economy wasn't doing too great. Uh, they just went through a corrupt presidency uh, in Richard Nixon. Uh, basically, throughout the 1970s, you have a conservative wave that uh, dominated uh, politics, 
America was going through a period of soul searching. Uh, you had basically before this decade, America was uh, pretty much dominated by Democratic Party politics uh, since the 30s to 60s, so a good solid uh, 30 years. And then 1970s, things uh, start to shift over. So uh, Gerald Ford steps in when President Nixon resigns from the presidency, he becomes the 38th president. He's the first ever unelected president in the nation's history. He's never won an election before. The first thing that he did was pardon Nixon of all charges. And this took a very, very uh, huge hit uh, to his popularity because many people thought that Nixon should have been uh, arrested and sent to prison. Uh, and so he tried to restore faith in the presidency after Watergate, but was met with very mixed results. Uh, and so Gerald Ford did not last too long. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, challenged him in 1976, and Jimmy Carter wins the presidency. And this was a relatively close race. Uh, this uh, is about the few times in our nation's history in which it was more divided coastal to coastal instead of more... Uh, north and south. But anyways, uh, Jimmy Carter wins all the states that you see uh, in blue. Of course, he's going to have a huge influence in the south since he is from Georgia. And many people thought that, okay, Jimmy Carter will bring some hope and morales uh, to the uh, White House. And so that's kind of why he wins. Uh, so we'll talk about this in this slide here. Uh, so during the 1970s, America shifted towards a conservative, towards Conservative, conservative attitudes, which resulted in Republicans getting elected into office. Uh, after the Watergate scandal, many Americans were looking for a president that could restore faith and morals. Uh, president Ford's approval ratings declined after he pardoned Nixon of all charges. Americans were fed up with Washington and the establishment politics. And so Jimmy Carter was seen as, a, as an outsider. Uh, he was, he's very religious, a centrist Democrat who served as governor of Georgia. He ran as an outsider with a hopeful platform to try to reunite Americans. And so that's kind of um, his appeal to voters. And that's why that's why he won. Uh, so uh, Carter has a couple of achievements. Uh, his most notable one, in my opinion, was uh, he was able to get Israel and Egypt to sign a peace treaty called the Camp David Accords. Uh, is, uh, basically, Israel and Egypt uh, were two are two countries that have long been uh, bitter enemies, uh, and it goes down to uh, border disputes as well as uh, religious uh, ideological differences. Uh, Israel is a uh, Jewish country, while Egypt is an Arab nation that is majority Muslim, and so there was huge uh, tensions there. But uh, President Carter was able to get these two countries to sign a peace treaty, and ever since this, uh, Israel and Egypt has not gone to war since. So, uh, however, there are um, critiques and criticisms uh, for the Carter campaign, or sorry, the Carter administration. You have Iran, which is this country that's colored in green out here in the Middle East. Uh, Iran had long been supported by the United States due to it being a major oil supplier and because it was a buffer against Russian expansion. So at this time, uh, Russia, Soviet Union, uh, is the largest nation on Earth area-wise. So you see this, these countries, you have Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, you have Russia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, all these countries are a part of the Soviet Union. And so Iran was seen as a kind of a holdoff between the Soviet Union towards the rest of the Middle East. Uh, Iran was headed or led by the Shah, who was becoming unpopular due to the uh, westernization of Iran. So by 1979, an Islamic extremist headed by, uh, headed by um, Ayatollah Khomeini forced the Shah to free, flee the country and took control. The Shah, who was ill, was allowed to receive medical treatment in the United States. And in response to this, revolutionaries stormed the U.S. embassy and took 52 Americans hostage under the Carter uh, administration. And this uh, basically was... Uh, very uh, tense times uh, for the world. So uh, Carter tried his best to uh, negotiate a release, uh, but he was unable to do so. Carter also ordered a secret rescue attempt, and the rescue attempt went horribly wrong when a U.S. helicopter and a plane collided, killing eight soldiers during a dust storm. Uh, the failed attempt made Carter look bad and would eventually lead him to losing the 1980 election to Ronald Reagan. 
uh, backed in with the uh, Iran hostage situation. The economy in the late 70s was also not doing that great. Uh, and so many people thought that Carter was just an ineffective president. And so they wanted change and they elected Ronald Reagan in January uh, 1981. And so as soon as Reagan steps into office, the hostages were finally released on Carter's last day. Uh, and they basically waited as long uh, as, uh, as Carter was out of office. All right, so uh, now throughout the 80s, uh, we're gonna talk about Ronald Reagan and then later on, George H.W. Bush. So uh, Republican Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980. One of his first priorities in office was to try to fix uh, the economy. Uh, he came up with an idea called Reaganomics, and this economic policy worked on the trickle-down effect. And what this meant was he kept interest rates high. He passed a 25% uh, tax cut, cut some social programs, and deregulated government control. And when something gets deregulated, it means that uh, there's not as much uh, oversight or, let's say, rules uh, or over overreach uh, from the federal government. So uh, Reagan's uh, deregulation led to the price wars, so lower prices and increased spending by customers. Though Reagan's policy had many critics, by 1983, the U.S. economy was in full recovery. However, uh, just like any presidential administration, there's uh, always going to be some scandal. In 1979, uh, in a country called Nicaragua, which uh, if you see my mouse, that is this country that's colored in brown, located in Central America. Uh, so there were communist rebels that overthrew a U.S. supported government in Nicaragua, and they began accepting aid and help from Cuba and Russia. So. Uh, the thing was that the uh, U.S. had a policy of containment to try to stop the spread of communism. And so this was seen as a uh, as a threat to the United States that, oh, no, that Nicaragua is turning communist. So that means that, you know, neighboring countries like Honduras and El Salvador, Costa Rica, they could topple down as well. And what happens if it reaches Mexico? That means, you know, our next door neighbors would be communist. Uh, so that was the. Uh, the fear that uh, the American government had uh, by this uh, uh, event unfolding. So uh, Reagan and his administration gets caught up in this uh, because uh, they began to secretly send aid to Nicaraguan rebels who wanted to try to overthrow the communist government. Uh, and so the problem with this is that it's been a long-standing U.S policy to not help and negotiate uh, with terrorists. Uh, and so when Congress learned of this secret aid, it banned Reagan from sending further aid to the rebels. And so individuals within the American, uh, within the Reagan administration secretly sold weapons to Iran in return for American hostages and sent the profits to the sales uh, to Nicaraguan rebels. And so uh, when it comes down to hostage negotiations, uh, you don't really negotiate with terrorists. And that was seen as a, a huge blunder uh, for his administration. And so uh, Congress learned of the Iran-Contra connection and began an investigation in 1986. And though Reagan approved the sale of the arms to Iran, he was found that he was not informed about the aid going into uh, Nicaragua. And so this person pictured here, he was General Oliver North or Ollie North. And so he took the entire blame on, uh, on this conclusion here. So uh, Reagan and so as far as uh, other Foreign policy matters is concerned. Reagan and Russian-led Mikhail Gorbachev met several times in 1987 to remove some nuclear weapons from Europe. And this agreement led Gorbachev to reduce Soviet spending on defense and aid to other communist-controlled countries in Europe. And this uh, later on will lead to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So. Uh, when George uh, H.W. Bush uh, took office in 1988, he continued Reagan's friendly relationship with Gorbachev and Russia. Uh, 
1989, several former Soviet-controlled countries were allowed to form non-communist governments. And in November of 1989, the Berlin Wall, which separated East and West Berlin, was torn down. And so trying to save uh, their communist ways, uh, communist leaders and some Russian army officers tried to overthrow Gorbachev. Uh, their coup uh, was unsuccessful. And in December of 1991, after years of economic stagnation, uh, left it far behind Western and Asian countries. And so Gorbachev announced the end of the Soviet Union. And so when Soviet Union broke apart, uh, this forms uh, 15 brand new countries. And so uh, basically, uh, during George H.W. Bush's presidency, he also had to deal with Saddam Hussein, who was a dictator of Iraq from 1979 to 2003. But back in 1990, he invaded the Middle East nation of Kuwait. And uh, this was the uh, main reason why the United States entered into the first Gulf War from 90 to 1991. And so Iraq is colored here. You have Kuwait and this uh, Kuwait is uh, had a lot of oil uh, refineries. And so Iraq uh, decided to, you know, want it and uh, invade it. So that's, you know, any type of purchases from oil from Kuwait uh, had to go to Iraq. And of course, the United States did not uh, want that to happen. So in Operation Desert Storm, uh, President Bush uh, was able to create an international alliance against Saddam Hussein. Uh, he was able to convince the United Nations to operate uh, uh, so sorry, UN forces to invade Iraq. Iraq. Uh, nations feared Iraq's leader Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait was an attempt to control the oil in the Persian Gulf. So uh, Hussein's army uh, was outnumbered and outmatched, and they ended up retreating uh, Kuwait in 91. And the United States declares victory in the Gulf War, and George H.W. Bush's uh, uh, me, approval ratings immediately shot up to 90%, one of the highest ever for any president. So uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, in any given circumstance, he, you know, in all polling and all in all retrospect, he should have won a uh, second term. He was very popular at the time. However, the economy in the early 90s was kind of in, heading into a recession. And George Bush uh, made some are kind of in the views of many conservatives. He went against them by uh, raising uh, increasing taxes and the economy not doing too well. And so you had in 1992, of course, another uh, election. And this time, President Bill Clinton uh, wins uh, in the White House. And so he has a mixed relationship with Congress, which had a majority Republican leadership. Bill Clinton is a Democrat. Uh, early on, Clinton faced congressional roadblocks on many of his proposed policies. One of the most significant uh, laws that was passed uh, was the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA was means to open up freer world trade and to drop trade barriers between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Though Clinton faced some resistance from Democrats in Congress, he was able to gain the support of Republicans and get NAFTA improved. However, uh, there was also plenty of scandal, just like any presidency. Uh, and so Bill Clinton, of course, had a uh, had an affair uh, with a White House uh, secretary, Monica Lewinsky. And so in January of 98, Clinton was linked to an improper relationship with a White House uh, intern. For the next seven months, Clinton denied a relationship ever existed uh, between the two. Uh, you can go on YouTube and you know watch the videos of Clinton denying uh, that he had uh, a sexual relationship uh, with uh, Monica Lewinsky. But of course, it turns out that uh, Clinton, in fact, did have a relationship. So, uh, by August of 98, Clinton finally acknowledged that he had an inappropriate relationship. And by mid-January 1999, the Senate began impeachment hearings against Clinton, charging him with perjury and obstruction of justice. Uh, impeachment, of course, is the, is the process of investigating a president. In February 1999, the Senate acquitted Clinton of the charges, and Clinton became only the second president at the time uh, to face uh, impeachment. Uh, 
Uh, let me go back real quick. Uh, so he became only the second president to face impeachment. Uh, he is found uh, not guilty and he's acquitted. Okay, so after Clinton starts two terms, there's the 2000 presidential election. Uh, it pitted Republican George W. Bush, who was George H. W. Bush's son, and at the time, uh, governor of Texas, against uh, Bill Clinton's Vice President Al Gore. And so important thing to know, for a person to become president, they must win 270 electoral college votes. Though Al Gore won the popular vote, the electoral vote came down to the state of Florida. And the results were so close in Florida that under a under state law, uh, a recount had to be conducted. So by November of 2000, the state of Florida was able to only count a percentage of the cast ballots declared George w, George W. Bush the winner by 537 votes. That is a very, very small amount of people. Uh, I'm, there are more people that attend that's probably in you guys, your guys' uh, grade, grade levels than there are that separated the uh, winners between uh, Al Gore and George W. Bush in the 2000 election. So because it was so close, Al Gore sued, arguing the results of the election. And because of the importance of the case and the fact that the Constitution requires the electoral vote be cast by a certain date, the case went immediately to the Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore. The court ruled in a 5-4 vote that there were insufficient time under the law for a full recount. And this was largely uh, voted on uh, basically partisan minds, uh, and the ruling left George Bush the winner of the 2000 presidential election. So uh, very early on in his presidency and the date that has uh, forever changed the world uh, and hasn't really been the same since. Uh, on September 11th, 2001, uh, hijackers took over four jetliners, crashing two of them into the World Trade Center towers. Mm -hmm and one into the Pentagon in D.C., and one into a field in Pennsylvania after passengers tried to take back control of the plane. And so then uh, the United States enters the war on terrorism. The attacks were quickly linked to a terrorist named Osama bin Laden, who is pictured here, uh, and his terrorist group called Al-Qaeda. Uh, President Bush ordered airstrikes and ground troops into Afghanistan, where bin Laden kept uh, his headquarters. Uh, in his State of the Union speech in 2002, President Bush calls Iran, Iraq, and North Korea a part of his axis of evil. So, in 2003, Bush ordered an attack on Iraq and its dictator Saddam Hussein, worried that the leader was supporting terrorists and keeping weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the initial invasion went well, with U.S. troops taking control of most of the country within six weeks. Uh, Hussein was captured in December of 2003, though no weapons of mass destruction were found. By the mid to late 2000s, the Iraq war was growing very unpopular in the United States, which led to many demonstrations and protests, as seen here. Also, uh, in 2008, uh, base, or basically in, in 2007, 2008, uh, not just the United States, but the world was going through a financial crisis and a recession. And this, of course, still happened under George W. Bush's uh, presidency. Uh, and so this did not look good on him. Uh, there was a housing and mortgage crisis that occurred in 2007, 2008. Uh, many banks made very risky financial decisions. They gave loans and housing approvals to people that did not necessarily need it. Uh, the housing market crashed and unemployment increased to roughly 10%. And so uh, in 2008, there is a, another election. George W. Bush has already served two terms, so he cannot run again. So it is a uh, senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, against senator from Arizona, uh, John McCain, uh, for the 2008 election. So uh, come, here comes Obama. Uh, he first rose to national prominence as a senator from Illinois during the 2004 Democratic National Convention when he had a... Uh, gave out a very inspiring speech on how Americans shared more similarities than differences. So it kind of put his name uh, on the map 
So uh, Barack Obama versus John McCain. John McCain was seen as a candidate with experience that could handle uh, foreign policy. He had been a senator since 1987 uh, till his death in August of 2018. Barack Obama was seen as a change candidate that related to the American people affected by the economy that was in decline with a hopeful, and optimistic platform. And so this is a picture of the 2008 Electoral College map. Uh, Obama uh, wins a lot of the uh, eastern uh, coast states uh, in the mid Rust Belt of the Midwest, western coast states as well. So uh, Barack Obama's optimistic and hopeful campaign platform resonated with a lot of people. He successfully tied his opponent, John McCain's ideology, to George Bush, whose approval rating was at an all-time low of 28%. Uh, and so it regardless, it didn't matter which Republican it was. It was going to be very difficult for any Republican to win an election uh, in 2008. Uh, America was looking for someone who wasn't an establishment candidate, which means more of the same. And also he had African-American and minority turnout was at an all time high that um, majority of them uh, voted for Barack Obama. So Barack Obama became uh, becomes the 44th president of the United States, and he's the first African-American president. Uh, so remember, he is also half Caucasian from his mother's side, and his father is from Kenya. And so that concludes this, uh, this slideshow and this presentation. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, took uh, something away from this. Uh, and until next time.